Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the talk of Professor Takio Kanade of uh, the Robotics Institute of Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I'm Chao Lin uh, from the Department of Electrical Engineering of uh, National Tsinghua University. I'm uh, very honored and pleased uh, to introduce uh, Professor Kanade's talk. The talk topic is Fun Research, Computer Vision, and the Robotics. And uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Kanade first. Uh, Professor Kanade received all his uh, bachelor, master, and a PhD degree from uh, Kyoto University in uh, year 1968. Uh, 1970 and 1973. Uh, then uh, he uh, taught at uh, the same university, at Tokyo, uh, Kyoto University, uh, for uh, about seven years. Then he moved to United States uh, to join uh, CMU as a senior uh, research scientist, associate professor, and then professor till now. And now he is a UA and Hayden uh, we take, uh, we take uh, uh, university professors in computer science and robotics. He also served as the director of the Robotics Institute of CMU uh, from uh, year uh, 1992 to 2001. Uh, uh, Professor Kanade received many honors and awards. Uh, just to name a few, most not uh, notably uh, the uh, Kyoto Prize in uh, year uh, 2016. And also the uh, Franklin Institute uh, Power Award in uh, year 2008 and ACM uh, uh, Triple AI uh, Aiden Newell Award in uh, 2011. He was also elected to uh, the member of uh, National Academy of Engineering uh, in uh, year 1997, and uh, uh, the member of uh, American Academy of uh, Arts and Sci uh, Sciences uh, in uh, 2004. And he is also, also a, a fellow of uh, ACM and IEEE, and he received other awards, including like uh, Okawa Prize, uh, CNC Prize, and IEEE Founders uh, Medal. So as we will be uh, introduced by uh, Professor Kanate, uh, Kanade later, uh, his research actually make, uh, make uh, fundamental and uh, seminal uh, contributions and impacts uh, to the field of uh, computer vision, uh, artificial intelligence, and also robotics. So the role he played uh, in this, uh, this field is like, uh, Yoda to the Jedi. Okay, so he's a grandmaster of uh, computer vision, uh, AI, and uh, uh, robotics. And today, his uh, talk we will talk about his uh, research model. Uh, motto, uh, think like an uh, amateur and do as an expert. So uh, he, uh, he had uh, several uh, language translations uh, for his book. Uh, in uh, Mandarin is like Xiang Wai Hang Yang Si Kao Xiang Zhan Jia Yang Si Jian. So uh, please join me to uh, welcome uh, Professor Kanade's talk. Thank you. So thank you very much for a kind introduction. 
Um, I, I'd like to make this talk fun. I'd like to talk about fun of research and fun research. Uh, both, you should, my, I have a belief that uh, research and development should be fun, not, uh, you know, uh, the pain or, and so forth. Uh, uh, so I like to, with that philosophy, I like to make this talk also fun. Now, this is the kind of thing that I've been involved at Carnegie Mellon uh, <clears throat> at once since I uh, went to Carnegie Mellon, uh, 1980. And I did probably almost all kinds of robotics and computer vision, ranging from mechanical design and control to autonomous systems, multimedia, and uh, so forth. And application-wise, the medical, uh, industrial, um, and uh, so whatever people think it interesting, I thought, well, that's interesting, I should do too. And uh, that's what, how I uh, did. Uh, <clears throat> so over time, when you do various things, from time to time, you have uh, what I call moment of fame. That means the a short period of time that your name is covered in media, and people uh, uh, in the street may know you. And uh, uh, so that kind of thing. And I had some occasion uh, like that. Probably my biggest moment of fame is my appearance at Super Bowl uh, 35 in 2001 by developing a system called iVision, which is like a movie matrix replay of good play anywhere in American football field. Have you heard, have you seen movie Matrix? Wow, I have not seen it. <laughs> but you know how that uh, famous scene uh, is captured at movie Matrix? The, you know, uh, at the highlight of the movie, the main character apparently jumped and then uh, he spins. Uh, that is actually made by placing a large number of somewhere 200 to 300 cameras in studio surrounding. Let me see. Uh, is this the one? Okay, let's see. I don't know this stuff is. Yeah. Surround the. So these dots are, are indeed cameras, and so they surround the a particular point, and then at that middle of the uh, studio, uh, the main character acts, and then uh, that is captured by a camera, an ordinary camera, and then at the right moment, all these cameras take a picture at the same time, and then the, this, the moment, and then this, and then those pictures that are taken are concatenated, so like this, and then uh, the picture from he here looked like that. Picture from here should look like this. Picture from here look like this. Picture from here look like this, and so forth. So by connecting them, you get the feeling as if time is frozen and the person is spinning around. Or if you fix the <clears throat> person, then uh, you feel that you are actually spinning around him. Either way. Uh, so that's how movie matrix is uh, captured. Now, what we want, what the CBS, the American uh, broadcast company, wanted to do was to do the same for the American football field for good uh, play. Yeah? And uh, however, you see, as you see here, the number one football field is large. And more importantly, you cannot preset where interesting play will occur. That depends on the game. So you cannot do the same as movie matrix, where the point of this convergence is set particular point. That point should be uh, controlled as the controlled and then monitored, I mean tracked as the play goes. So the system that we designed is to prepare a large number of robot cameras, about we actually use 33, 
uh, each one of them can pan, tilt, zoom, and focus. In other words, pan, tilt, zoom, and focus under uh, computer control. So if the play is here, then the, uh, all the cameras look this way. And as the de play develops, the, each camera begins to move. Uh, the, the, all cameras move accordingly. So that at each moment, movie matrix setup is held at the particular, uh, hopefully, interesting point in the field. And all those cameras are connected to the control room outside of the stadium and controlled from there. So that is the idea of, uh, <coughs> of uh, eye vision. So we actually um, developed a small uh, model, uh, one twentieth scale model at the basement of our lab, uh, like this. And uh, this is Mitsubishi Heavy Industries uh, robot, PA-10. It's a pretty good robot. At that time, it cost about $80,000. And uh, then we, we, we practiced uh, in the basement. Uh, and then, the, then those each unit uh, was like this, uh, robot and camera and high zoom. Uh, this is a Sony high quality uh, camera, uh, very expensive. And uh, big zoom lens because from here to here, for example, is about 150 meters. So you can see how big zoom you need in order to capture individual player at the right size. And uh, actually, I climbed there. It's windy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very scary, actually, uh, from there and, and so forth. Uh, and you know, football, America, the, uh, the Super Bowl is a big event, if you know. It, they say it costs it, uh, about $600 million, US million dollars, uh, is uh, uh, spent for just one Super Bowl event. You can see how big the event is, right? And uh, so whenever I say some, anything, the CBS people, Professor Kanade, don't you know that this event is six hundred million dollars? So that anything you say is like that. They respond. So, for example, uh, you know the uh, oh, oh, the <coughs> these cameras placed and let's see uh, placed and they are connected through cable to the control room here. You see each unit is connected with uh, ethernet cable, video cable, even power cable. You may think that the power is taken from uh, you know, out faucet next by, and I thought that's what we would do. And they say, no, 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 Professor Kennedy, don't you know that? They say, Super Bowl is $600 million event. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, if somebody kicks the cable, and uh, you, know, the, you lose the power, that's not good. So we actually generate the power from here. And even the power is actually sent to individual units. Everything is like that. And uh, uh, so, so the, even the cable is 500 meter per unit. So 33 of them. So cable alone, it's an 18 kilometer system. You can see how big the system it is. And uh, this is how uh, it turns out. Now, during today's coverage of Super Bowl 35, CBS Sports will introduce a new technology called iVision. He is it provides gymnast, panoramic famous. coverage similar to the special effects in the hit movie The Matrix. Announcer. Here at the Super Bowl, 30 robotic cameras have been mounted on the scoreboard you and see. all along the upper deck at intervals of seven degrees. Each camera feeds into one so of the 30 time, specially designed the video recorder was this big. In the, the images are then camera. computer calibrated to instantaneously show any time. spot on the playing field from all angles within the camera's 220 degree range. Professor Takeo Kanade of Carnegie Mellon with designing the software that blends 30 cameras into one well, dynamic yeah. panorama. This is a gigantic robotic system. You have to have 
perfect idea of the direction, position of the cameras, and the relationship of the amount of zoom, amount of focus, to the command that you give from the computer. And that is one of the hardest jobs. So this is inside the control room. Here it is. This is an example during the warm-ups. Take it just a, a moment ago. The pass from Banks to Davis. And look at the way he can whip around. We're all looking forward to it. By the way, it can be used in instant replay situations. So these are the super case stars. Ex-super stars. I met them. Tonight about eye vision. If you're wondering what it is, this is what it looks like. You got a pass rush. Quarterback. He drops back. Look, he sees a big see lane. Look at that big lane. So he steps up into it. It always makes it easy for a quarterback is to have a clean line of sight. Watch Trent Dilfer, nice look off. Looks to his left, and nobody in front of him. Look at that nice lane. He can see the receiver down the field. And what a throw. This is halftime show. Brian it's, uh, that's, how, that's how it worked, you know? So uh, you see my uh, appeared in Super Bowl? So since then, oh, thank you. <laughs> Super Bowl ha is broadcast, is observed by 500 million people in the world. It's a big event. And uh, so, uh, so I, since then, I usually brag myself, the only professor that has ever appeared on Super Bowl. <laughs> and it's a moment of faith. And this moment of fame is indeed a written part of contract between Carnegie Mellon and CBS. So the contract, development contract that CBS pays Carnegie Mellon, the money, actually has a clause which explicitly says, Professor Takeo Kanade must appear with his type name and title clearly shown. You see, my name is clearly shown during the broadcast of Super Bowl for 25 seconds. <laughs> and can you imagine, can, can you know, do you know that how much it costs to have a commercial, a Super Bowl, for one second cost you 100,000 US dollars. 100,000 US dollars. Huh? 25 seconds. <laughs> 2.5 million dollars worth of event. So that's uh, one of my, uh, probably the biggest moment of fame, 25 seconds moment of fame. Uh, uh, the other, a little more recent moment of fame is, do you know a guy whose name is Bruce Willis? You know, a strong guy who never die. Uh, I was in his movie. And when I said this to my students, my students said, oh, professor, did you appear as a you know, street <laughs> person, as an extra? I said, no, I appeared as Takeo Kanade, real person. Hmm? Real, not, not, a, not an extra. So Bruce Willis, see, Dr. Takeo Kanade. Uh, 2.5 seconds. <laughs> so this is genuine uh, moment of fame, uh, uh, really. Uh, 2.5 seconds moment of fame. Uh, now, why I ended up appearing in this movie, it's a long story, so I wouldn't tell you. If you're interested, I will tell you later. Uh, now, so uh, I, let me get a little more serious. Now, <clears throat> when I ask many people like you, what is your wish as a researcher engineer? Most people actually say to perform good research. Probably you answer that way too, I guess. To perform, to do good research. Now, when I ask then what is good research, most of you have a little hard time to actually define what is good research. You see, indeed, you ask yourself, what is good research? You know, you, 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 somehow you feel, I'd like to do a good research, and I feel that way too. 
but it, defining that is not that easy. Now, to answer that, <coughs> late Professor Alan Newell, who is a very famous person, uh, who is one of the uh, originators of uh, artificial intelligence today, along with uh, you know famous people like, along with McCarthy, Minsky, and uh, Herb Simon. Uh, so Newell is is was very respected scientist, and uh, he was genuine gentleman. Uh, everybody listened to him, and he said that. Good research, science, should respond to real phenomena or real problems. So basically he said that you have to solve the really, really the, the existing prob the, the problem that exists in the real world that must be solved. Number two, good science is in the details. You may think that a good and the big discovery and so forth, the Nobel Prize and so forth, may consist of discovery of a huge new thing, huge idea and so forth. Of course, that's not bad, but it's not necessarily that way. You know, it can be a very small, detailed thing. I think it comes from God is in the detail uh, saying in, uh, in religion which basically says that God, which is a big you know, existence, may not be the, the top of the this and, the, and so forth, but maybe just around you. That's what it, it, uh, it says. Um, he's also said, the final test of wh whether you did a good job or not is whether what you did makes a difference in the society. And that's a real test. If it does, it's a good job. If it didn't, probably you didn't do a good, good job. And I think this is a very important statement. You know, I think that, uh, so uh, I think at Carnegie Mellon, we always listen to him. And uh, I think this is a very good guideline of how, what, what constitutes a good science. Good, uh, And then, of course, he, he was a scientist as well, so he used good science, but maybe you can just change it. Good engineering, good, almost good anything, what we do, probably, uh, <clears throat> you know, match with this statement. Now, in order to do a good, that good thing, I observed myself, uh, observed the, the kind of events that happened in the research, and I came up with uh, some uh, sort of a set of observations. Number one, Successful ideas are often surprisingly simple and even naively trivial. Have you had that experience when somebody s says a great thing or even great uh, new product? Or when you read a good paper and say, wow, this is a good paper. And at the same time, you probably feel, well, isn't that, that all? That's a simple idea. Indeed, I actually had that same idea even 10 years ago. I think you have, I am pretty sure you have had that experience. And the, more, the, simpler, the simpler it is, actually that's more impressive because of the fact it's simple. And, uh, and the simpler the, it is actually probably more true, more fundamental, it is. Yeah. So in other words, idea need not to be enormously huge, enormously complicated, enormously, you know, sophisticated idea, it could be relatively simple. Now, if that's simple, then what is, everybody should be able to do so. Why is it so not so easy to come up with such a simple, straightforward idea that look like that way after the fact? I think the impediment to such a simple thinking is indeed what I call I know mentality also known as, quote, expert knowledge. Have you had that experience? Whenever you've got a good idea, the first person who says, oh, no, no, that's not the right way to do, is indeed an expert in that field. In the university, professor. <laughs> in, in industry, your boss. Indeed, professor like me has uh, probably 
professional uh, pressure that uh, says we always have to demonstrate that we know better than students. Uh, you know, that's a, really, isn't that a pressure <laughs> that you have? Uh, uh, therefore, whenever students come and say, I, we are tempted to say, oh, don't you know, your idea has been already done. Read uh, so-and-so's 1965 paper. It's written already. And it didn't work. And we feel that, oh, I did that job of professor. Uh, uh, that's uh, typical. And that's, uh, uh, of course, that's very understandable. Why? Expert is indeed, is a person who learns what to do, how to do, when given a problem. That's why he's paid. And most of the time, by the way, he's correct. That's why he is worth being paid. Yeah? At the same time, though, the fact that he learned what to do in a particular situation, given a problem, quite often actually limit the scope of thinking. So in that sense, he's correct, but may not, may be limiting the scope of his thinking. Yeah? Uh, now, does that mean that uh, we should have uh, all naive uh, amateur get together and then do good research? Probably no. And definitely no, I would say. In order to do a good job, I think you ne we need real knowledge and skill and methodical, methodological, methodo methodological uh, approach and execution. And that's obvious. I think you, all of you know that. For example, uh, autonomous driving I did. Uh, you may think that, OK, when a car is a little bit to the right, to the left, then you should turn the wheel to the right to the right. When the car is a little bit to the right, turn the wheel to the left. Now, if you write the code as that, then the car does not necessarily go straight. Why? Because that code does not have the professional concept of gain in control theory. That means the amount of correction must be a function of speed and the amount of Error, error means, in this case, the, you know, off from the road and so forth. Or in computer program, you know that uh, equal doesn't exist. Or uh, an easier example is uh, inside the computer, geometrical theorem does not hold because of floating point. I have a very simple example where you, we have a triangle. And we know geometry theorem says the, <coughs> the bisector of this angle, this line, bisector of this line, and bisector of this angle, three bisectors, will meet a point, middle point. We know that. Therefore, when given a triangle, and then you ask the writer code, to compute this point, you may think, OK, that's easy. Compute the equation of this bisector, of this angle. Compute the equation of this bisector by this angle. And compute the intersection point. That should be the same, according to the geometrical theorem, same as intersection of this and this. But inside the computer, that may or may not hold because of floating point, especially when the, these, this triangle becomes shallower, and be, these two bisector becomes to become, uh, come to uh, intersect in a shallow angle, then the position of this intersection point is very unreliable. Not, not just a little bit of error, completely wrong, amazingly wrong. You know, not just a little, yeah, not just a little. You, can, you should test it, actually. You can write a code to check how this, uh, unstable that number is. Therefore, if you're a professional programmer, you should actually compute the bisector of these two and use these three lines equations to compute the appropriate point possible. For example, one uh, well, na even naive idea would be compute three, one, 
three intersection points between this and this, this and this, and this and this, and then, for example, average of them. Now, that's a little naive way of doing it, but still probably a lot better than the first one. Probably a little more professional one would be uh, you compute the point which is the closest to these three points. Yeah? Things like that. That's a professional way of doing it. Okay? So that's what I meant. Now, I, I do not, by the way, mean the good project should be uh, amateur come up with an idea and prof uh, professional uh, execute. No. I think uh, probably all professionals. But what I meant is when you think, I think you pretend as if you were amateur. OK. So I call it think like an amateur, do as an expert. And I even wrote a book on it in Japanese and translated a couple of languages into uh, the language that you can read. Uh, if you're interested, buy one. Uh, okay, now, so how actually uh, do this? I think the, probably I, of, I often say to my students and myself actually, probably write, make a scenario, make a story of how your research will lead to success. If you picture success of your research, meaning that, okay, when I, this is done, where how my result will be used. And then what will happen? How people use it. How people actually like it. If you can actually picture it and say, wow, I can imagine how people are impressed and then use this and then uh, use this, uh, what I did to, you know, uh, this, this way and then he may even do this way and so forth. Then probably you're almost there. Okay? If you can picture it. So I call it picture success. And then, of course, in doing that, be sure to think freely and with fun and expand the story. And probably most important thing is so that other people can join. However smart you are, what you can do is fairly limited. Therefore, by talking to other people and also by writing a paper, and if the paper is impressive, then other people say, wow, this is good research, I'll do that too. And other people will actually add to your idea and as a whole, what you do will influence a lot more and make a bigger difference, just like Professor Newell said. I think that's probably the right thing to do. So let me go a little bit about what uh, the kind of scenario that I had. Of course, some of the scenario was probably created afterward, but that's OK. And sometimes you can justify, make your story a little more fun than real uh, So uh, for the research. Uh, that led to many camera uh, system. In early 80s, vir the virtual reality was a very popular topic, virtual reality. Today, too. Uh, it, and then that about 80, 85-ish was uh, toward the end of 80s. It was very popular at that time, as the beginning of that. And many people worked on head mount display, cave, uh, so that uh, people can feel and uh, sense the, in the virtual uh, reality. Uh, in other words, create the virtual reality, do simulation inside, and observe that. But I thought, why do we want to do virtual reality? I think, I thought that, well, the reason is that there should be a corresponding real reality in which we want to do experiment, but the ex that experiment is either hard or expensive or even not possible. Therefore, you want to do correspondingly this thing, which is called probably simulation in virtual reality. For example, what happens if that building is not there? Now, you can demolish that building, then you can check it, but probably you don't want that. What happens if you go to Mars? Now, at, this, at least today, you cannot. Therefore, you cannot do the experiment there. Therefore, you may want to experiment inside the virtual reality. So if so, displaying from virtual reality to real reality, that is human, is 
that is important, but at the same time, even equally, or even more importantly, going the other direction from real reality to the virtual reality. Modeling, you may call today's terminology, should be as important. That's what I thought. Okay? Therefore, maybe the right thing to do is to come up with some technique to actually model, maybe as a first step, three-dimensional world. So the laser range finder, which is very common today, you know, uh, Velodyne, for example, that, uh, you know, Google car and my mini car, probably you're working on that kind of thing too. Do you use the Velodyne uh, scanner uh, today? But we thought that kind of thing back then. Uh, so about uh, 25 years ago, you know? Is that right? Yes, 25 years ago. Uh, and then we built a uh, sensor that can de measure up, up to 60 meter with a 10, one centimeter accuracy uh, at the speed of 125,000 points per second. And uh, what it does is uh, we have a laser below and then emit the light and then uh, reflect it from the, with the mirror. Then the mirror can both spin and nod and therefore spin, uh, scan 360 degrees horizontally, so surrounds you, and 60 degrees vertically this way. And in total, four million points per one scan seen, and 125,000 points a second. So it's about 40 seconds to the whole. And it also, at that time, this was rare, but could actually, like Rodine today, um, sense the, under the sun, in the sun, uh, they see, uh, below is a point distance, and then you see point clouds, uh, collection of the point clouds show the shape of that building very clearly. At that time, this was a very rare machine which could do this. Uh, so this is the inside of Carnegie Museum, which is next to Carnegie Mellon, and uh, scan the whole building, even person there. This was fairly strong laser. I hope that was correct. Uh, and then uh, take a picture and paste it, paste them on 3D model. And you can see now uh, the, the building from uh, any viewpoint. Today, this is very common practice. You, you know that uh, this is used. At that time, it was very rare. Now, people are working on similar thing, but I thought you should go big so that you impress other people. And uh, our people went to Cape Canaveral and this is rocket launcher. It's a huge object. Uh, this is a one floor. And you see the whole floor is digitized. And uh, even you see the person at the tip of the crane is digitized. You know? Like that. And the wires and all these small things that are digitized. So this was a really impressive machine. At that time, at that time it was a dot-com age about nine, early 90s. So everybody who came to my, our lab said, Professor Kamala, this is an amazing system. So we thought, okay, good idea. We should make a company. And we founded a company. And we made a business plan. First year, we sell five units. Second year, 50 units. Third year, fi 500 units. Fourth year, three founders will, uh, will be a millionaire. And that's our business plan. Uh, we could sell only one unit, that's it, only one unit. Even that, I call up my former students in Japan who had a large, large amount of research money and say, hey, you should buy this one. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only machine we could sell. Uh, the reason is it's uh, too expensive. Everybody was so impressed. But as soon as they heard this price tag, $300,000, Wow, that's, we don't want that anymore. <laughs> that's it. It's too, too, uh, too much. 
maybe the time was not correct. Yeah? Uh, so we actually had all kinds of story about the failure of a uh, startup and, and so forth. Uh, and then, uh, and of course, we, we instead, we actually moved on to a modeling business. So instead of selling sensors, we just built our own, use our own few sensors and uh, get the business from people who wanted to say model, to create the 3D model of that historical building next to Carnegie Mellon, uh, and then uh, create this kind of thing uh, um, here and there. Uh, and today, by the way, this type of thing is a standard business. Uh, it, sometimes it's called as is modeling, as is modeling, and sometimes a uh, certain regulation actually requires you uh, to regularly check the position, shape, and so forth, the mutual relationship of the equipment and so forth, like a big power plant. And uh, so there's a business in this area. But at that time, uh, I think the business didn't go that well. We did uh, various things, like went to uh, Egypt, and uh, you know, map the tomb, king, tombs of kings and and so forth. It was fun, but not uh, not as commercially successful events like this. And uh, even built a small uh, sensor that can be carried by a helicopter. Now, by the way, this is autonomous helicopter. Today's like a drone. We actually did this back in 1963 to 66, 96, or 96, 96, 93 to 96. We had this helicopter fly completely autonomously, not, not remote, completely autonomously and do a lots of things. Even we could actually fly over the field and pick up a plaque about this size from air, not delivering things, which many, uh, some companies boast. We could even pick up objects from uh, ground autonomously, not, not the remote control, autonomously. We could do that, you know. Uh, so a lot, of, most of the drone things that people taught today, I think we have demonstrated back then, mid the 90s. Uh, anyway, so we built this, and then uh, this thing can actually scan over certain uh, area, uh, like uh, tree lines over, uh, and then uh, if you let's see. Like this, so you see the how, how what what is the situation uh, below the tree lines could actually sense. This was a little military scenario where we actually our plan was to have uh, many small drones below the tree lines, and then this bigger uh, helicopter flies over and then uh, send the overall uh, situation to the individual drones, which cannot see far. Okay. Um, and large area mapping, like this. Uh, this is an Air Force uh, base. I think fairly big, more than 500 meter square buildings and so forth, and then do uh, change detection. Scan this morning and scan tomorrow morning and find out what the difference. And we found that the location of the garbage cans were different <laughs> tomorrow, uh, this morning and uh, yesterday morning, and things like that. Uh, now, however, the, the world is more dynamic. 
So we thought that, okay, scanning the world with the range finder uh, with uh, 40 seconds per frame is fast at that time, but nonetheless, not fast enough to capture dynamic motion. So we thought, okay, we should build uh, real-time 3D range mapping capability. So we built a machine of real-time stereo that can generate not only the color image, uh, this is my, when I was young, and uh, uh, depth image, 200 by 208 bits at uh, 30 frames per second. So you see, I'm actually doing uh, like this, like this, so my uh, foot is closest, my you know, arm is next, and body and background uh, shown as a distance image, which you can do uh, today with uh, Kinect, yeah? This was then cost me to build, to cost DAPA, DAPA paid this, $3 million to build this machine. $3 million. Today, Kinect, less than $300, $100, okay. Uh, so you, you see how amazing the progress is. But at least I, I, I think I'm happy that we made a trend. As soon, by the way, as soon as I showed this, within a year, people began to do the same without, without this five, $3 million box. Yeah. The first box was this big about this board, VME format, 13 of them, it consumed five kilowatts. So as soon as you turn it on, the whole room was hot. <laughs> it's an amazing machine. Yeah? It generates uh, real-time uh, video of the scene. It used the five cameras in order to make the disparity computation easier and less uh, ambiguous because the repetitive patterns uh, uh, ambigu ambiguous. So this is version one, black and white. And uh, so range uh, <coughs> image like that. Okay. So once we did, we thought that maybe maybe what we should we should be able to do was, now we are going back to the virtual reality world. So we said, uh, we, we should be able to do, uh, create, here's a scene, and with this machine, we can create the range map. And therefore, and also we know how individual pixels look like. Therefore, we should be able to generate synthetic view from other direction, which is obvious because the, the problem is nothing but the computer graphics problem. But when you do that, then there will be a hole which is not, which is, which correspond to the portion that was not visible from the first view. And from here, you know, the back of the particular person is not visible, okay? If I move this point, then it began to be visible, but I didn't have data on this. So you have a, we have a hole. So how, how to, what to do? How to fill that in? And then I, I, we thought that uh, instead of try to fill that in, which I call it impossible problem to solve, because how come can you guess what is not visible? Okay. Uh, so we thought uh, the right thing to do is to put more camera there so that that's visible. Now, two cameras won't see some area, no problem. Put three cameras, third camera, no problem. That won't do the job, no problem. Put the fourth, and so forth. Keep doing, yeah, until everywhere is visible. And here's uh, our idea, that the whole room is covered by a large number of cameras, and you see enormous combination of stereo and everywhere. You solve all of them, and then it's captured into data, and put in a CD-ROM. See, at that time, no DVD, so it's CD-ROM. And then sold it to poor medical students so that he can observe famous surgeon surgery anywhere he, he wants. If you can do this in real time, then we can put millions of 
medical students into inside that room without congestion. So that was the idea at that time. One of the hallmarks of Carnegie Mellon Robotics Institute is as soon as you think, you do it. Don't think further. Just do it. Okay? So we actually built one in 1995 with a 51 camera system, all these black dots which look like Hitchcock movies birds. They are cameras. I had my classmate from my uh, you know, university time who was a director of Panasonic. So I called him up and said, send me a large number of cameras, as many as you have. And he, he sent me 51 of them, and I put them here. And then we wondered how to digitize, yeah? Now, uh, today, the, when you buy, see today, young, the, all the young students, when I say, okay, that's digitized, take a digital picture, so you say, oh, that's easy, just you know, call, uh, type Amazon and bring a buy a camera and then put the USB and that, that's it. But at that time, there was no such a thing, 1995. You actually have to buy a device called the digitizer about this size, put that inside the computer, and each one of this board cost about $8,000 at that time. So if you have 51 camera, yeah, even the digitizers themselves cost $400,000, US dollars. So that was not cheap enough. Moreover, even when you could, your, our computers at that time was not fast enough to cap, take all the data in, inside the memory. Not fast enough, okay? So we thought, okay, maybe that's not a good idea. What should we do? So the solution is we actually get videotape recorder, VCR. Uh, most of you even don't know videotape recorder anymore. <laughs> it's, it's a basically tape recorder, tape. Magnetic tape. Huh? And again, I called up my friends and sent me 51 videotape recorders. And he did. And you see here? Deck of 51 videotape recorders. And all these cameras output recorded there with a time code. Therefore, we know what frame of this tape corresponds to which frame of this tape. So that afterward, we can digitize one by one using only one digitizer board. But if you have 51 videotape recorders, even doing the re experiment is a lot of work. Because if you want to start, you have to, my student had to press 51 start button <laughs> of DCRs. And my students complained, Professor Kanada, you are a robotics professor. Before using us, why don't you develop robots to press button. <laughs> and I said, I understand, but I won't. The reason is, graduate students are a lot cheaper than <laughs> robots. And uh, we let them work. And uh, so once we do that, so inside the event occurs, and then we digitize, and a four-dimensional model, X, Y, Z, T, created. Um, and uh, create synthetic view. And this is 1995 output. Not too bad. I think these days, this kind of thing, you know, Microsoft does that too. I think they call it 4D, 4D something, I think. If you go to internet, Microsoft 4D, I think they, they, they do. Okay. Okay. And in 2000, uh, everything was digital. So you see the PC rack, uh, big uh, rows of PCs there. Okay. But 2000, everything was digital. Okay. Um, and uh, by the way, this, the previous one, the first one, this, the creating this one took about a week from input to this one, including all of this manual work. Week, whole week. 
Today, probably, as my, uh, Microsoft did. I think you can do it in real, well, basically real time. I, I can't imagine any impediment to that. Okay, so the eventual uh, picture that we had is what I named virtualized reality. I wanted to differentiate virtual reality from this. Because that is a real, not virtual. It is a real reality which was virtualized. So I call it virtualized reality. And the biggest, biggest picture of this whole thing, easiest way to explain is, I call it, let's watch the NBA on the court. So the NBA court is covered by a large number of cameras, and you can watch the game from anywhere you want, including inside the court. And uh, now this didn't happen, but uh, somewhat uh, various things occurred in the, along the course. Uh, now overall today, if you look at it, multi-camera technologies are used in entertainment, and I'm pretty sure you have seen eye vision like uh, uh, movie uh, commercials and uh, sports are used almost everywhere today. A large area 3D modeling is very common. Multi-aperture cameras are even available commercially, which will, uh, which are capable to, for example, capture uh, scene uh, and find a picture of focus everywhere afterward, rather than uh, uh, checking the, you know, adjusting the focus. Uh, you didn't do it afterward. And even fi interesting thing is, if you have a large number of cameras aligned, then, for example, you know the first row, second row. Uh, in this scenario, people in the say third row uh, is somewhat occluded by first row people. But if I change the viewpoint, some of the rays will have the line of sight, okay? Therefore, if I have a large number of cameras, then by collecting appropriate rays, which will be able to see behind the first row, by collecting them and creating new picture, we should be able to generate a picture without, the, with, by removing the first or second row of people or seat, okay? So that's possible. So see-through uh, capability is possible. Uh, and security, and mic even microscopy, large number of camera uh, microscopy, which allow, gives you three-dimensional uh, ordinary uh, light field um, possible. Right, uh, okay? Now, bright field possible. Now, I have to tell you one interesting story. The first paper that I wrote about that real-time video uh, video machine, video rate, 1993. We wrote the paper. We thought it's a good paper. What, uh, can you guess what happened? Well, we submitted the paper to PAMI IEEE. It was rejected. And this is reviewer's comment. Devices that use this many unnecessary cameras are too expensive to use, be useful. This was a comment. And therefore, this paper, what this paper presents has, doesn't have value. Reject. And one sentence before this was more interesting. <laughs> it says, people like Takeo Kanade, who has a large, num num large amount of research dollars, might be able to build this machine, but, it says, <laughs> but devices that use this many <laughs> unnecessary cameras are too expensive to use for. And if you think of it, reviewers are experts, naturally. You know, professors and researchers. And, and they think that five cameras are too many, too expensive. Even 1993, and today five cameras, nothing, 10 cameras, nothing, 100 cameras, nothing. 
you, know, you won't be surprised to, if anybody said, oh, let's use 100 cameras. They'd say, OK, or think. You won't say it's expensive. Never. Yeah? But this was the comment. I said, this is a good example of how limited or how sort of caught, pre caught the professional idea is. Okay? Now, since uh, people say that, I thought maybe we should go the other direction. And uh, we began to build 1,000 camera systems. <laughs> uh, we have it at Carnegie Mellon. And we use a lot of interesting things. Uh, so let's change a little bit. A face is my favorite topic. And uh, <clears throat> my, uh, this is my PhD thesis back in 1973. Oh, by the way, one thing I brag, I have to brag this thesis, is that back then, 1973, digital image was so rare, you, you can't imagine. There's no digital image at that time. Okay? Today, if you want, you take a picture with your cell phone, it's already digital. At that time, no. Picture was not digital. It's only in the form of film and so forth. So having a digital picture is a is a asset. So one research group has only one picture or two. <laughs> so you write the code which can successfully analyze the one picture that the research lab has, then you can write a paper on it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, on, on your algorithm. And your algorithm is always successful. Why? Because only one picture. You can, <laughs> you can change the parameters so that it works. And if you happen to have 10 images and test your 10 images with your program, we could proudly wrote in the introduction of your paper with a large scale experiment. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. Back then, this is true. This is true. Today, if you process 10 images and then send a paper, reject it. <laughs> uh, and then at that time, uh, my professor was forward looking. He had 1,000 face images collected in 1970 World Expo in Osaka. So my program was tested with 1,000 images. So at that time, it's three orders of magnitude more tested than other typical programs. Uh, and then uh, since then, in the uh, mid-90s, Henry Rowley, Henry Schneiderman did this uh, excellent face detection, which is, I claim, basis of today's uh, capability that you have on your cell phone. You know when your cell phone or a camera, you see a face shows up, square? That's exactly started from here. Uh, now, of course, it's very interesting if you look at this. The program pick up this. This is not face. This is a picture of face. See? So is it a picture of face? So, so precisely speaking, even today's program, it's not a face detector in that sense. It's a picture of face detector. So what is the difference between the two? Actually, it's a very interesting question. And uh, if you can solve, uh, I, I think you, I, I'm pretty sure this is doable, but uh, it's interesting that one. Uh, today, this is one of our programs, face alignment, uh, which is as good as almost human placing the points, including can deal with occlusion. And the program even knows which part is occluded. Not just it could overcome occlusion, but it actually knows which part is occluded. There's a big difference between even when occlusion is, occurs, it does a good job, is not the same as program knows where is occluded. Okay. Uh, you should actually test that by this kind of phenomena. If your, say, suppose it have a cap machine has the capability to detect the position of the nose and mouth and so forth, you can check it if the program knows or not by the following test, okay? So this one, if it does the right job, and then what you should do is you bring in a piece of paper like this, okay? And by doing this, 
if these position never changes even a pixel, then the program is perfect, right? If the, by this, it does a good job, but if it moves even a little bit, then the program is doing actually funny thing, right? Because this occlusion should not affect, affect the position of nose and so forth of this part. So if it does, if the result changes even at one pixel, the program actually cannot, does not explicitly understand occlusion. That's a test. There are not many programs that can do this. And this program can do it pretty well in that sense. Okay. Uh, so that's a fairly, fairly philosophical, uh, somewhat philosophical, but even practical issue. Uh, this is Simon Lucy, my colleague's program. Uh, not mine, but uh, he has a very interesting program, which is commercial. I think he wrote this in Australia. Um, now, the good thing about this program is it actually detects nose 3D. So he, the program puts uh, glasses on it, but it's not putting a glass picture on it, but it's putting the glass object onto the object of face. Therefore, actually, it can do this, you know? You see the big difference? It's not a manipulating picture, it's manipulating the object. So, and then uh, he can do this with the uh, cell phone. It's an interesting uh, program. Uh, technically, the big, one of the biggest challenge of this one is the size. Because if you only use the camera, you can take the pick, you can obtain the shape, but not absolute size. That's impossible. You need some reference, okay? Uh, and then, unless you know absolute distance, say 20, 20 centimeters and so forth, you cannot put a actual object, which has a size. Therefore, depending on the size of the glass, the appearance will be different. You see, that's a big difference. And this program knows the size, so it can actually adjust the size of glass appropriately, which is a very big challenge. And then this program solves that problem. We, uh, one of my colleagues, Yasa Kirsi, is doing an extraordinary good job, which is now able to obtain all these, you know, positions of the hand, leg. See? From picture. So actually when I do this, program knows that I, not only I raise the hand, but whether I raise the hand this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. Big difference. And uh, it actually, <laughs> this, so it's really an ordinary video, because obviously it's a movie. By the way, this, these are fake people, <laughs> impersonated uh, person. In the US, this is, the, these stupid programs <laughs> exist. <laughs> and even fingers. So from here, I can tell some of you are doing this, some of you are doing this, some of you are doing this. The, in other words, if I have a camera, the camera knows that. Like this. Yeah? And you can instantaneously see, I'm pretty sure, many, many applications that you might want to develop on top of this kind of program. I'm pretty sure, right? And if you have, uh, all these previous ones are camera only, and this one with, la with uh, multiple cameras, because it uses the output from that studio. Okay.
So the video actually can do quite well these days, you know? All right, so uh, let's see. I'm, uh, how am I doing? What time is it now? 11? 11.15? I can, I can talk a little more? Yeah. OK, so that's OK. I will. Now, one, one of the things that I, I always advertise my students is that it's fun to build the real systems that work. And as I said, I, I've done uh, different things, space, trust walk crawler, uh, like a space station, uh, computer assisted surgery. Uh, my program actually used in several, uh, our program my students developed, I used in several uh, surgical systems, um, and, uh, surveillance, helicopter, and driverless cars. And then uh, one of the work that we did, a driverless car, we started with a small car and then built a nav lab called, we called nav lab, navigation laboratory that combines the camera. Uh, not only we have the camera online, onboard sensors, but also uh, back then, 80s, we used the sun micro uh, station. Uh, here, I, I'm not sure how many people have ever used sun workstation. Uh, probably this <laughs> people front row may have used it, newer people or not. Uh, though we put those micro uh, sun workstations on this machine. So we used to say this is uh, one of the earliest system that could, that has a to model that use, people use today. That is an uh, onboard sensor, onboard computer, and also we said onboard researchers. We put the students on it. Huh? And so that while being, while testing, uh, you know, you worked on it. Uh, testing, you can uh, debug the program and watch how your program is doing, uh, you know, in real scenario. And then uh, if it doesn't work, then you change the code, recompile it, and run again. So it's a lab. Okay. And uh, often uh, our joke is that we told our students, you are sharing the fate of your program and your body. So that be sure, <laughs> be sure you write the reliable code. Otherwise, uh, it may be dangerous, that kind of thing. And, uh, and we built the, Yeah, oh, might take a while. I wonder. So anyway, uh, hmm. Somehow the program is going to freeze. It should be okay. And uh, so we actually developed the various capabilities uh, ranging uh, starting from 86. At that time, this was a DARPA program called ALD, Autonomous Land Vehicle Program, uh, not just uh, driving uh, ordinary road. Uh, but we, uh, over time, shifted from uh, natural terrain driving to uh, the roads. Hmm. Let me find out why. Can you guess what's the problem? Now, one thing I should never do is turn off this computer. <laughs> then it will not. That's 
the end test. the program. Yeah, let's wait a little bit. I should do it. It, uh, I can Yeah, so this is a very early, in the, indeed, a very early pro program. This machine could move only one centimeter per second. So it's barely moving, you know. And uh, so we ventured to uh, inside the park next to Carnegie Mellon. This is the road uh, uh, between uh, next to Carnegie Mellon, and then this is the suburban area, uh, and then uh, you see we have a range finder at the top. This is a big one, and then detect the obstacle like that. Um, the story often we use that, that that boy is the son of a person who wrote the program to stop the vehicle <laughs> when a dangerous thing, uh, case happened. And it began to drive road. So this is probably 90, if you, two, three, about that time. You see the rain, the lane tracking, and obstacle detection, and, uh, and then so forth. So, th so those are done, and we built a series of ro uh, robots. Uh, and then, 1995, our group did uh, what we called "No Hands Across America" campaign. So from Pittsburgh to San Diego, 3,000 miles were driven autonomously. Back in 1995, so 22 years ago, you know, not 100%. So when you are there, you know, the program may or may not work well. To say that is a strange thing, but, but so the person was on the driver's seat, hold, not hold, but prepared to hold <laughs> the uh, wheel like this, like this. So whenever something wrong happens, ah, then do this. <laughs> So we used to say that being on an autonomous driving car is more tiring than <laughs> <laughs> driving yourself. Uh, that's true, by the way. And, then, uh, and that, that challenge is still here with us, right? Until the level goes four. And uh, then... Uh, in San Diego, we went on to Los Angeles and met a famous person, this person. And this is me. This is, uh, this is uh, Dean Pomelo. This is Todd Yoakum. These two, uh, the work uh, they did, actual work. And then this is famous comedian, Jay Leno. Jay Leno. Uh, Jay Leno is the most popular comedian at that time, and he always uses a joke, using uh, uh, says a joke using a newspaper article. So he used this one. No hands across America. So there's an article, news article, which says, thanks to Carnegie Mellon University researchers, 
For the first time in the world, people on the car can take off their hand off the wheel and do makeup, read newspaper, drink coffee. New article said. And Jay Leno said, how come that's the world first? People in Los Angeles have been doing that for a long time. <laughs> and that was his joke. And so, uh, so we thought that we should show the car to this guy. And this guy, you guys, famous as a car collector. Uh, he has a large number of e tremendously expensive cars. So that was fun. And as you know, afterwards, all these uh, okay, we have this is Red Whitaker coming down the scene, did, and this is 100% of time. And afterward, you see the team went to Google, and, uh, and the rest of the history that you know. And today, I think you know that uh, autonomous uh, driving car is there with us, and uh, we are going to the next stage. So let me talk a little bit about the new project that, uh, a little newer project that I was involved uh, more recently. It's called Smart Headlight. You know, when you, uh, your car has a headlight. Headlight is important, but may, interesting enough, headlight has never changed over the last 120 years, except the illumination source, acetone, electric, halogen, key, uh, xenon, and LED. All of them are called floodlight illuminators. That is, it sends as much as possible lights fo forward to shine the object seen front so that reflected light will be will, uh, observed by driver to know what's happening in the scene. Now, <clears throat> with that, so our idea is that if we have a little different idea where if we change the, the headlight with the projector, basically, which can control individual rays, okay? In other words, you see that projector? Say, suppose this is 1,000 by 1,000, can control millions of pixels so that, for example, this one, it sends a lot of light. This one, it sends zero light. This, this one, it's maybe less light, and that one, it sends a light with color red, you know? So that's a projector. So projector is pro illuminator in that sense, but pixel rays, individual rays, say medium rays, uh, individual rays can be controlled. Okay, so let's imagine at night driving, rainy days. Rainy days, you have this kind of scenery where Rain appeared to be white. Why is it? Rain is made of water, which is transparent. So rain is like this, you know? Water. So why water appears white? The reason is the shape is circular, which acts like lens. And due to the big difference of reflection index, it actually reflects light back, just like a principle of fiberglass, that which doesn't lose light. Okay, it's inside; it stays inside. Uh, <clears throat> that's why. Okay, it's annoying. So let's think of a f headlight with which driver won't see rain on a rainy day, night so that he thinks as if he's driving a fine day, fine night. Yeah? How? I told you why rain appears white. Because your headlight shines it, shines it. Therefore, the solution is obvious. See? Think like an object. Solution is, when rain, let's see.
when rain begins to fall, let me see why this doesn't play. Oh, okay. Somehow lost. Media on, okay. Well, let's see. So when the rain comes, yeah? The right thing to do is when the rain comes, detect where the rain is, and you turn on and off the rays so that uh, your headlight ray will not hit the rain. Then your, the raindrops won't be shined, therefore it won't reflect the light back to you, therefore you won't see them. That's how you do it. Huh? Now you may wonder, can you do this? Answer is extraordinarily simple, extraordinarily simple. What you do is you place camera and detector at the same location. Now physically you can't do, therefore what you do is you use beam splitter 45 degrees so that light reflected to this way. So if you actually, you know, fold, then you see camera and projector at the same position. So what you the way you should think is, you can think of a camera, each pixel has the capability not only to receive the light, but also send the light, okay? You just think that. So this camera, which has both capabilities, what you should do, you turn on all the pixels so that they send the light very briefly, okay? And take picture instantaneously. Then what it should it look like? Should look should it look like? Then it should look like this. Now to human eye, rain is streak, but the uh, rain is raindrops. Don't forget, okay? And the raindrops doesn't fall that fast. The maximum speed, it depends on the size, is about 10 meter per second. It's a very slow phenomena. So if you take a picture with a one millisecond exposure time. Indeed, they look like dots, okay? And luckily, we're talking night background is dark. And as I told you, when you shine it, raindrops appear white. So now we know where the raindrops are in the field of view, even though we don't know where in the space, okay? So once you do that, what you do is you shine the light if there's a raindrop, the light will reflect it back to you, and it'll tell you, okay, this ray will hit the raindrops. As soon as you see it, turn it off. This ray will not hit the raindrops, therefore, this pixel will be dark. If it's dark, keep on. Keep it on. That's it. Then, for the brief period of this testing, probing, it's on, but the rest is off. The rest is okay. Now, in reality, it takes a little time to do the whole thing. So by the time you know what to do, raindrops will move a little bit. Where? Most likely below. Therefore, if you find a pixel which has a raindrops, then the little Lower pixel is a dangerous pixel. Make sure you don't turn it on. Above pixel is very safe, unless the next raindrops comes there. It's a rare. Okay, so turn it on. Side, probably okay. This is above right and left, probably okay. Above lower left and right, somewhat dangerous because wind may bring this way. Okay, so you can have a sort of a danger probability map. So turn on and off according to the inverse of that probability. Okay? Now, don't forget the fact that what is important is throughput matters. Throughput, that is, what percentage of the light will hit, don't hit the raindrop. If you don't want to illuminate the raindrops at all, the best solution is obvious. Turn off your headlight. That won't do, okay? Okay, so once you know that, then what you do is buy projector, exactly that one. 
and by camera, connect the, those two with the processor with the half mirror. Okay? So by projector, modify it. The reason that you need to modify is these projectors today are made of so-called DMD chips, that is an uh, array of mirrors which can be controlled very fast. But uh, those projectors or for human use is very slow, 60 hertz. Yeah? So, but uh, we won't make it fast. Uh, the chip itself is fast, so we change the interface so that we can use it. Brightness of that kind of projector is very bright, as bright as headlight. Don't worry. Okay? And connect that with and on, uh, the modified uh, projector is combined with a camera in front of it with a half mirror and put it in a box, take it to the garage. Now we have a new <laughs> We have a new car. Huh? And when you see rain with it, you see, you don't see the rain. It's designed that way, so we should do it. When you see uh, snow, you see less. Okay? Now, do you want this, <laughs> that <laughs> uh, headlight today? Well, probably not, you know. So, but uh, I think it's a more indicative uh, statement. So instead, probably the most the close Cl much closer application is this headlight high beam, low beam control. When you're driving night, you, rel you red want your headlight high beam so that you can see far, especially uh, countryside with the road, with uh, no street lights. Okay? But when the oncoming car you see, you are supposed to lower the beam. Why? Because your high beam headlight will hit the oncoming road driver's eye and may make blind him for a very short period of time. And more dangerously, for people like me, who is 50 years old or older, will take eight times longer to recover. So isn't that scary, all of you, including me? are driving for a fairly long time blindly. I think you have that experience. You, see, you don't see it, but you think it's okay, and then you're going. Very dangerous. That's why there are lots of accidents. But if you think of it, you don't need to lower the beam at all. What you should do is turn off the ray of light that will go into the eye of the oncoming car's driver. As long as you turn them off, small number of rays, he won't see it high beam. Yeah? Now, exactly knowing where the <laughs> uh, oncoming car the driver's eye is difficult. But we know where he is. Where? When you see two round of pattern becoming bigger and bigger, Wider and wider, they must be headlights of the oncoming car. If you see that, then this is where the driver is. So turn off that portion. And do the same with the rear mirror. See, is it annoying? The guy from behind will hit your rear mirror. And you don't know even who, who is behind. Okay? So turn off them. So if you do that, then you see your own view, you are shining a lot. High beam. Other guy, this is other guy. Not, not uh, bright at all. They, of course. Because our car's light doesn't hit them, except the, you know, the uh, scattered light. That's why we see the light. Okay. If there's no scatter, by the way, then we don't see the headlight. Okay. The scattered light comes into my eye, your eyes. Okay. 
And once we understand this, then uh, let's, we could do, for example, a lot of interesting things like unmarked road or, see, we, bec today we know, the car knows where to drive. Therefore, the driving lane, you should send more light. Or today's uh, car knows where the pedestrians are, where the bicyclists are by uh, more advanced sensors, even better than human. So once detected, send more lights for them. Yeah. So like that. And even put the marker. OK, so and then make it uh, small and then put in the, in the uh, inside headlight, then you could have the whole thing. Now, if you think this way, it's interesting that projector and camera, they're the same. Only difference is direction of light. So you can think of a camera which has a DMD chip in front of CCD, which controls the rays that goes into the CCD chip. chip. Then the simplest application of this is, for example, is we know exposure time today is the concept per frame. But we can have, we can control exposure time per pixel by sending certain period of time, don't sending light toward pixel, but irrelevant pixel. Okay. So we can have a camera that has different exposure time. So the fast exposure time for a bright pixel and, and so forth. And uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Narasimhan is doing extremely interesting thing by using such a concept, um, uh, amazing sensors. Uh, I won't go into detail. So let me finish with a little bit of a story. Value of research, as Professor Newell said, I think the value of research is not just <clears throat> new. I think we tend to be too too preoccupied that research has to be new. I think university people tend to think that that way. You know, we, we have to come up with a new, quote, new idea, new, new, new. Is it really new? Is that important? Indeed, if you think of it, lots of great, great discovery is not necessarily new in the sense that nobody has ever thought of. Yeah. Lots of things are old. Yeah. Actually, whether you can make a certain idea into working idea or into the idea which is as succinct as valuable, then that's a research value. Not just So in that sense, new in my mind, newness itself is not virtue. Usefulness is, that's my saying. Huh? So that is the same as research focus. In what way what you do will lead into valuable, useful value. That's what's important. Okay? And when I say useful, some people really argue. No, no, universities should do fundamental research. You should not talk about usefulness. And some people even say, dare to say, use, basic research is useless. That's why it's you, basic. I think that's wrong in my mind. I think, in my mind, that misunderstanding of the real meaning of usefulness. Usefulness, that doesn't mean just making money. Usefulness is actually solve the problem which is valuable. We may not be solvable before, and so forth. And I think, not, in that sense, nothing is more useful than basic research with a genuine problem focus. And all those, all those stories like uh, DNA, you know, double helix discovery or the, uh, internet uh, development uh, shows that, that genuine basic research which has the success, which has a story, which has a scenario, has enormous impact. And not just doing so-called basic research without purpose, I think is a mistake. And, and so forth. I think I have a story about about these things, but I'll skip. 
And I just add a point. Chances favor the prepared mind. And uh, I think uh, if you have a scenario interesting, some of the unexpected phenomena can lead to a new discovery, which is often said, you know, serendipity. And serendipity doesn't happen to ordinary people. Serendipity happens to people to only who has some focused idea in my mind. Now, of course, I have to say, in general, it's hard to predict the value of research. And I have to add uh, my own story about this, uh, my favorite story. You know, there's a problem in computer vision. There's a pattern in the first image. And that pattern moves in the second image. And we want to know this displacement, u. In other words, how much, how, how far this pattern moved in the second image. So this vector u, you know, this amount horizontally, this amount vertically. Knowing that is very important problem for almost any vision problem dealing with motion. Driving, you see, we want to know how much things appear to move, how much other patterns move, and so forth. Yeah? Uh, MPEG and all those things based on motion. Now, the solution for this is in one sense obvious. You make, you put, create the pattern around it and <coughs> scan other image and find out the location u, x plus u, at which if you compare the pixel of original pattern and uh, this other pattern and see the difference between every pixel. And per pixel, you uh, find the difference and square so that it becomes always positive, and sum. So it's, this is called SSD, sum of square difference. And if the pattern is exactly match, EU should be 0, because all pixel, same value. Okay? If it's a little bit different, small. Okay? So the problem should be, Find u that minimize this error, SSD, it's called. Okay? And the obvious solution to this is actually to check everywhere and find out where the smallest u is, the, where the location of smallest u. Now, even computer is very fast. If you do this check everywhere, you can easily see it takes a long time, too long, especially because you have to do this thing for all pixel in the original image. Because then you have to search all pixel in the target image, which is n square. And you should do for all pixel in the original image, which is also n square. So it will be n to 4 problem. If n is 1,000, then it'll be 10 to 6 problem. Uh, no, no, 10 to 8 problem. And it's a very difficult problem. Okay, So a lot of people worked on this early 80s, and my students worked on that too. And one day, my student, Bruce Lucas, came to me. Takeo, I got a good idea. And I asked, what is it? He said, well, you should be small in general. Therefore, you can tailor expand this fx plus u, and it'll be like this if you take the first term. Okay? And if you put this back to this equation, now u is outside. Therefore, this equation becomes quadratic equation of u. Yeah? And meaning that minimum of quadratic equation, all of you know. I think it's a high school problem, right? High power minimum. y equal x squared plus b x plus c. Minimum is x at x equal minus b over 2a. We know that. And that, that's exactly this one. It's a two-dimensional, so it's a little more complicated. Uh, but if you do this, then without searching everywhere, by just once computing derivative of f, which is derivative of the target image, then we should be able to compute this. Okay? Bruce Lucas was very happy. So, Takeo, this is a great idea. Let's write a paper. It works too, I and mean, indeed it worked. And I said, no, Bruce, no, you shouldn't write a paper on it. And Bruce was, Bruce was unhappy. Okay, why? 
I said, Bruce, think about it. Your work is not new. <laughs> you used Taylor expansion, which is known for 300 years. <laughs> and you used knowledge, which is 300 years old. And what you did is nothing but minimization of parabola, which is high school students can do. So your, what you did is 300-year-old idea plus high school students' math. The combination of the two ha cannot have any new value. If you write a paper on such a th with such a content, the reputation of Takeo Kanare is in danger. <laughs> Therefore, you should not write a paper on it. Now, Bruce is a very persistent person. So Bruce said, Takeo, we should write this. We should write. So I finally gave in. I said, all right, you can write. But be sure you write a paper in a very obscure place so that nobody would read a paper. <laughs> and he did. He, we wrote, he wrote on, uh, to a conference, never wrote a journal paper, never. Guess what? Amazingly, this paper, which is such a simple thing, was one of the most reference paper, more than 10,000 references. And now it's called Luke's Canary Algorithm. <laughs> and used, and by the way, it's, it's the most reference paper out of my 400 paper publication. <laughs> and it's used everywhere, if you know of this field. For anything that involves motion, this is the base, most basic algorithm that everybody uses. So if Bruce Lucas listened to me, probably today I'm not talking to you. <laughs> no? Thanks, Bruce. And uh, therefore, I have to say to all your students, if your professor thinks your idea is wrong, probably it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, OK, so, so let's use, say, my Kanata saying, convinced. I think convincing is you know, the local way of convincing. Best way to convince is show it that it works, like Bruce. So my saying is, if they ask, wow, your algorithm is good. How come your algorithm works so works well? We are, we are happy. But they are not yet convinced. If your audience is convinced about your work, they would ask, how much is it instead? Working algorithm, working method is the winner. Two, do fast. This is Harry Shum of uh, Microsoft CTO likes, what I, likes out of what I said to him many times. If you come up with a good idea, there are at least two more people in the world who think the same. Make sure you are the one who do the, that first, not, not say it first. There are a lot of people who said say it. Who said it first is not important. Who gets there first is. OK, so with this, I have to tell, I think the last point, comments that I'd like to tell you is that there are enough problems in the world which are waiting for you to solve. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have a few minutes for questions and answers. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, yeah. Oh, very far. <laughs> uh, you uh, need to, to use, use, a a use, a microphone. use a microphone. Oh, I'm interested in for the stereo vision, vision part. Uh, why did you use the odd number camera, like 5 or 51? Uh, and this. Did, did say what? what? Uh, for the stereo vision part, the previous part, uh, you used like odd number cameras, like 5 or 51, for the multi camera system. Uh, I just wonder why did you use the odd number, not the. 51? <laughs> yes, most we think the stereo <laughs> is <number>. like. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you mean 51? Yeah, 51. Uh, you, you always I answer the question. I 
I bought, uh, when I bought the 51 camera, that's the end of, that, that's how, how, end of my uh, project fund. So, uh, <laughs> the more the better, more the better, obvious, more the better, obvious. That's, by the way, another thing I often say. Numerosity counts. Numerosity means number. Number counts. And if a, if a large number of some anything can solve it, use it. I think a lot of, we, we tend to think, oh, what is the minimum number of x? Good problem. You have to think about that. But maybe just if the number can solve the problem, use it, use them. And, and then think afterward. Do we really need, need them? Which is a much simpler problem. Then from the beginning you say, what is the minimum number? You know? Requires a lot of thought. In other words, simplicity wins. Okay. Uh, and and I, 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 want, I wonder, uh, you say about we need to picture the scenario in advance of your research. Uh, so. Did the results always meet your scenario? I mean, like you, you say in the- Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. You, yeah. you picture, I think that, that's very true. I think, I mean, the question is what? I mean, how? Uh, you, he means that uh, if all your results meet uh, your oh. original picture? No, not necessarily. I think you're allowed to change. Indeed, most of the time it, it'll change. That's okay. Yeah. That, that's okay. I think uh, my, my saying about that is uncertainty is different from ambiguous. In other words, you cannot do any research without having concrete idea what will happen. That should be clear. However, that idea need not to be certain. You can change it. That is very different from I don't know what this will, is going to happen, but someday it may happen. That's ambiguous. That's what I call. Ambiguous is no. Uncertainty, acceptable. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your success stories in your career. Um, uh, we are like that. And we all like to hit the success in our first shot. So I would like to ask you a different questions. How do you look at failures? How do I look at failure? Uh, that also, uh, my half joke answer to that question, I never failed. <laughs> <laughs> The reason why, reason is I do, I work on until, I worked on, work on it until I succeed. Uh, now this, of course, you understand, this has certain, a little bit of overstatement. But there's some truth in it, some truth in it. I think I, I change the story, I change the work, change the goal, and so forth. But I think, uh, so in my mind, it's continuous. On the appearance, it may be different. I give up, possible. But uh, in that sense, I think I continue most of the work. Uh, and I think many industry uh, business people appear, apparently, say the same to me. You know? So, uh, so I, I think, uh, to a certain extent, being persistent is, I think, is very important. Uh, and, and I value that too, you know. Um, so uh, now that's of course the official answer to you. And if anybody's interested, how miserable I was <laughs> from time to time, uh, I can tell. Okay. And I'm curious for researcher is to bring impossible to possible, and and the, re the final result is to bring possible to affordable, like your Valentine. Like, like the Valentine like, like that. So did you think as a researcher need to think about the affordable problem uh, when you're doing the research? Uh, like, like you made a LIDAR, but in the, in the end you cannot sell it. Somehow I have a little hard time to hear. What, what, the, what was the question? Uh, I, I mean, the, for the research, researcher is to bring the impossible to possible. And 
and like to possible researcher part uh, a, re a, a good research possible. Oh, uh, uh, no, impossible will never be made possible. But things which appear to be possible, impossible, make it possible. I think that's a good pro good problem. Indeed, uh, one I, I wrote in my book actually. One of the DAPA manager said Tom Stratt told me a very neat statement. Who said? I asked him. What is the program manager role of DAPA? He said, and then he ans his answer is to make, to work on the problem which think people think impossible. He said, he didn't say, make what is impossible possible. He said, what people think impossible possible. Yeah? And uh, I think there's a slight in and a very important difference. And then that, that is, that differentiates good, good person from, good researcher from purely dream person who cannot make, deliver anything. I think that's, be sure that uh, you use that knowledge correctly. Yeah? So I told expert and this and that. That doesn't mean that you should, you shouldn't use knowledge correctly. Uh, yeah, so that's a realism. Realism, realism is important. I think uh, I'm. Hopefully, I didn't uh, tell you. I, you won't take what I said is uh, just dream, and then anything will come true. No, no way, no way. I think you have. I you think you there have is another question. Uh, question? Yeah. Uh, turn it on. A very short, a very short question is that the. Uh, how do you comment about the current direction for the algorithms and the neural network for the further artificial intelligence? Will there be a perfect blend or mix in a very few na nature or, or, or not, not possible in a few years? Very interesting question. Now, I myself do not view learning in terms of deep learning and so forth opposite to development algorithm. I think they are similar, they're the same. I think learning, at least today's learning is, you define the computational form, right? Because a deep learning network defines a form, not particular function, but the form. In other words, functional is defined by neural net, and you find the best function one out of that functional, yeah? So in that sense, that's a way to find a hopefully good function, which is sometime directly derivable from the model-based way, sometime no. And that's okay to me. And uh, uh, so, so one I really I'd like a comment is that hopefully all of the new young youngsters will not say, oh, all the vision, all the robotics, all those uh, model-based uh, learning is over, learning means the study is over. All you have to do is just get to come, uh, you know, get, get a hold of deep learning program and then plug in your data and then somehow magical thing happens. Never, never. I think you can solve a simple problem but not the deep problem. I think you still need, I think, our deep thinking, and that's obvious to me. Yes, I think, I, I hope you agree with that. Okay, uh, due to the time limit, we can accept the one, one more question. Uh, any other question? Yes, go ahead. So I want to follow the previous question, is that since that deep learning has largely re revolutionized the area of computer vision, so what do you think is the value of this kind of traditional method like Lucas Canale algorithm? Uh, I would say yes, it obviously it's used, or still used. And uh, say, for example, Lucas Canale algorithm will be, uh, let's say, I, I don't see Actually, I don't see any conflict 
between the two. Uh, I don't see, quote, deep learning will replace it, never. Indeed, in that sense, Luke's kind of problem is a much simpler problem that doesn't require uh, deep learning because it's such a simple algorithmic or mathematical structure that is, that is obvious to, to, take it, to be taken advantage of. Therefore, it's there. Okay? So uh, I think it, probably you don't mean that, but if I give you very, uh, how should I say, offensive answer, <laughs> The two, that's an irrelevant question in my mind. Okay. Um, so, again, uh, again, the, like human, if they, I think, uh, of course, by the way, I am a big, strong believer that AI will eventually supersede humans. No question, no question. But uh, for, for a long time, I think, Human, the, the reason that we are, we seem to be pretty clever is that we have a two combina combinations of this, somehow come up with this, combine everything into some procedure, even without explicit knowledge, which is quote learning. The other one is explicit knowledge, which is declarative. You can state and deliver to other people by, by writing. The other one is, of course, what I learned here cannot be delivered to you because I have no way how to deliver, except in the future if my connection can be connect directly transferable to you, then you learn what I learn. And of course, vice versa. What you learn, I can learn instantaneously, okay? So in that sense, this model-based declarative knowledge is enormous power because it's such easy to transfer today. Okay. So, okay, for the time being, you, I think all of us should trust your, our quote intelligence. Okay, thank you. So let's thank uh, Professor Kanade again.